Today we're taking a deep dive into Nissan's SR20 DET engine. Despite being 35 years old, oh my god, these engines have stood the test of time and are still relevant to this day. Let's talk history. Let's talk what makes them so good, how they stack up against similar motors, and finally, the proper way to build one in 2025. Now, one of the things I'm going to qualify this video with, we're wheel and tire guys. We are not engine builders. If you guys are looking for super in-depth technical information, check out Motive Garage on YouTube. They probably have more of that than we do. And if you're looking to actually build one of these, there are a lot of shops that do a really good job of them. I think Mazworks is still building motors. I haven't had an SR, right? But we're going to give you a broad overview. We're going to give you some cool background information. Do not take this as the gospel truth on how to build an SR. It is a fun little YouTube video that can hopefully teach you some stuff that you might be able to apply to your own car build. But again, we are not engine builders. So I don't want to see you guys in the comments like, actually the bore clearance is, at, bro, I don't care. Unless you want to buy some wheels, it's irrelevant to us. <laughs> yeah, boy. Anyway, back to the video. And if you like it, subscribe. And if you don't like it, also subscribe because either way, we do put out a lot of really valuable content on wheels and tires and suspension, stuff like that, that we do know a lot about. So check it out. Okay, let's go. Anyway, we're going to talk history of the SR20 first, and a good place to start is with the name. Now, if you're not familiar with Nissan naming conventions, guess what? You can break the name down into little segments that tell you exactly what it is. SR, the engine family. It doesn't mean anything. It just means this is an SR engine. 20, the size of the engine. It's two liters. D, dual overhead camshaft, equates to DOHC on Hondas. E, electronic fuel injection, and T, turbocharger, the most important part. Don't buy that SR20 DE, you're getting scammed. Now you probably know them as the engines found in the S13, S14, and S15, and this is the version we are talking about today, the rear wheel drive turbo SR. There's also an NA version, the SR20 DE, which is found in lower trim S chassis. They're decent engines, they're just missing some goodies that you need, and there's also a front wheel drive version. So there you go. Now starting in 1991, if you live anywhere but North America, Sorry, your 180SX, 200SX, or Sylvia would have come with an SR, whereas in North America, our 240s came with a freaking truck engine. I'm sorry, KA guys, it's a truck engine. The SR was a replacement for the CA18 DET. If you're unfamiliar with the CA, it's basically an RB. They cut two cylinders off. It uses a cast iron block and aluminum head. They are not terrible engines. They are also not great engines. There is a reason that literally no one runs one in 2025, and they don't really compete with the SR20. No, the higher output does not come from the extra point two liters of displacement. SRs make power because of a better flowing head, netting a 50 horsepower gain over its predecessor. Again, you can buy a CA, but just like, why, right? Now, as I mentioned earlier, there are front wheel drive versions of the SR. They were actually in use a few years before the S13 and carried on a few years after the last S15 rolled off the production line. Some do have different displacements. There's a 1.6 liter SR16 DE found in the Pulsar GTIR and a 1.8 liter SR18 DE found in the Primera. Now in the States, we got a two liter front wheel drive in the Sentra, and unfortunately not a lot of parts are interchangeable between front and rear wheel drive applications, or at least not the parts that you really need or care about. So what makes the SR a legendary engine? And why should you care about putting one in your S chassis or whatever you want to put it in? Well, the chassis it came in, obviously is the first one. A legendary car needs a legendary engine and vice versa. Think Supras, Evos, Skylines, etc. The SR20 is another prime example being installed in the S chassis, possibly the most recognizable drift and heck even probably tuner car of all time. The SR is a light compact engine that gives these cars close to a 50-50 weight distribution. Now you might be saying, well, what about all the swaps people put in S chassis? Why are they taking SRs out if they're so good? People love RBs, JZs, and even LS motors, all of which have greater power potential. You you really cannot make all that much power out of an SR. You lose the beautiful weight distribution of the SR. I, I want to qualify that without spending an insane amount of money. But methodical engineering is one of the biggest things here. And when it was first conceived, drifting was not a thing. Nevertheless, the engineers cooked up something that could withstand a tremendous amount of sitting on rev limiter type of use. See, unlike its Honda counterparts, the SR is a closed deck block. That means more rigidity in the bottom end. However, the crankshaft and connecting rods are forged, with turbo engines getting thicker connecting rods, the pistons are cast, but DET engines all have oil squirters to cool down the pistons under high heat. Pistons are thought to be a major weak point on the SR, but with proper tuning, they can hold up to more power than people think. The head flows pretty darn well on these, some people might contest this. Sure, when you compare it with something more contemporary like the K-Series, the SR lags behind. Fortunately, you can do head work, because there you go. During the 90s, it was very impressive, and it still hangs with modern four cylinders to this day. You gotta think, this thing was making these power levels in 1991, so there you go. Now let's talk aftermarket. It's pretty much like the Build-A-Bear workshop of JDM engines. 
if you have the budget, the possibilities are endless. There might be a better platform to do something, but the SR can definitely do it. Parts have been developed all over the globe. If you're a purist, you can build an SR with only OG Japanese brands, HKS, Tomei, Apexi, June, etc. Now the boys down in Australia and New Zealand have built some really cool stuff. You've got like Telford Cams and Hypertune. They come to mind on this one. Right here in the US, Mazworks is probably the big Mac daddy here. They've developed some pretty badass drag racing SRs. If you want, you can do bolt-ons or your build can snowball pretty much indefinitely. You could build a stroker engine. You could swap on a VVL head, effectively Nissan's version of VTEC. You could add sleeves. You could do a billet block. You really can spend as much as you want to on an SR. Now it's easy to get scope creep when you're building an SR, but in the next section, we will explain why simplicity is normally best and why there's a pretty proven formula for these engines. So where does the SR shine and not shine? Well, from the early days of SRs, drifters in Japan pretty much solved the SR. They cooked up the perfect recipe to build one that is reliable, that holds power. And the idea is not to strap on a big old turbo and build a Dino Queen, but rather to build something that is ultra reliable for what it is, high response, and it would give the driver many, many enjoyable track days with minimal effort. This method has been going strong for the last 30 years. Honest to God, the first SR240 I bought and the stuff I see now are the same car. Simplicity is key here. A typical build is going to leave the internals mostly stock besides a upgraded head gasket. A lot of people run a Pexi. Upgraded springs and drop-in cams are optional but recommended. Then you get a larger bolt-on turbo, injectors, ends, plus Power FC for tuning. Power FC is a little dated. People can kind of debate that. I like Haltech. There you go. It's good for like 300 to 350 horsepower and the Japanese philosophy on building cars is centered around basically driver mod, driver mod, driver mod. Now in the West, we love overbuilding our cars, but problems happen happen when you start to push the SR past really like 550 at the tire. The stock sleeves and transmission won't like this, and this is where many builds are spiraled out of control. The old limit used to be 400, and then people kind of solve more, but there you go. You can build it to your heart's content, but you're going to get diminishing returns. And at this level, it would frankly be pragmatic to just switch to a different engine platform. Honestly, you could literally just go Jay-Z or LS or even RB, and I'm like, not a big RB fan, but big turbo SRs are like lag monsters or tiny displacement. There you go. There's a reason why everyone started copying the Japanese method for building these things. And it's because it frankly just works really well and doesn't require you to overbuild or overspend. Now we're going to talk versions. There are many different versions of the SR, but there were also some updates along the way in the S chassis. And that's what we're going to really talk about. These are the ones that matter if you're buying one and they can be identified by their valve cover. Red Top SR20 was the first version. It was found in both the Sylvie and the 180SX from 1990. 1991 to 1993. As the name implies, it came with a red valve cover, but shady people will spray paint their red tops with a black valve cover, so don't just look for red. The major drawback here is a tiny little journal bearing T25 turbo putting out a whopping 7 psi boost. Red tops aren't bad, they drive pretty good, they make like 205 horsepower. T25 turbo, 7 psi, they're early on, they're fine, I've owned a bunch of them, you're not going to dislike them. Now you've got the black top SR20, which is not to be confused with the notch top, which also has a black valve cover. This engine was only found in the 180SX from 94 to 98, and there's not really much to change from the red top. Meanwhile, the S14 got a much improved engine. So if someone's trying to sell you a black top for like a lot more money than a red top, you can kind of just be like, hey, bro, like there's no reason I'm going to spend this much more money for this. There were some updates. It's the same T25 turbo. It's the same 205 horsepower. It's basically the same motor, but with a black valve cover. Then you've got notch top or slant top SR20s. This is no one calls it a slant top. There you go. It's the most sophisticated SR that came in the S chassis. These are easily identified because of their distinctive valve cover shape. The rear of the valve cover kind of slopes downward like this, and there is a bulge at the front to accommodate the valve timing control, the VTC. VTC is generally a good thing. It gives faster spool. The valve cover also has internal baffling, kind of like a built-in catch can. The intake manifold was redesigned and featured a larger throttle body, and above all, the turbo was upgraded to the big Mac Daddy T28, journal bearing on the S14 and later ball bearing on the S15. The S15 turbos, guys, just anecdotal experience, S15 T28 on an SR is like one of the best driving SR setups you can get. It's so buttery smooth. They made about 250 horsepower, again, like some slight variations across the years. T28 turbo came in the 14, came in the 15, 94 to 02. Improved the intake manifold, improved valve cover, VTC, and there you go, that's basically the difference. But every great engine does need its Achilles heel, and for the SR, it's in the head design. Maybe saying, Jake, what the heck? You just told me that the head is pretty darn good, but failed to mention this one tiny little thing. See the rocker arms that you wanna stay in place? 
they tend to not stay in place. They tend to just leave the chat and fly off. And it's because the SR doesn't have fixed rod mounted rocker arms. They are actually wedged between the cams and the valves with nothing else holding them in. They're just like floating there. It's kind of silly. The problem was addressed in later on front wheel drive versions of the SR, but at high RPM, SRs tend to puke out rocker arms. They are especially sensitive to sitting on rev limiter, which is exactly what you're going to do with one, and yet they can hold up to drifting, so how? Well, it's not possible to completely solve the issue, but we can mitigate it. This is going to get really controversial. People, this is Coke and Pepsi here, so there you go. Ditch the rocker arm stoppers. They are meant to solve the problem, but they don't. Name brands still sell them. Some people still run them. The modern thinking is they don't help. They can actually cause more issues. I have run them. I like them. Other people don't like them. Your preference. They can cause damage if the rockers fly off, so just bear that in mind. Mods that actually help. Stiffer springs can prevent valve floats, solid lifters, and quality cams. Look into the dual valve guide mod for even more assurance. Again, rocker arm stoppers. It's contentious. There you go. Find a tuner that has SR experience. Set a slightly lower rev limiter and make it soft cut help prevent disaster. Do not run two-step on your SR if your tuner suggests it. Kick rocks, find a new one. So you want to build one in 2025, Well, we know the strengths, we know the weaknesses, we know the history, we know what they came in. But it's time to get down to business. What parts should you consider for an SR build? And guess what? We also sell uh, parts to build your car, not just wheels and tires. So here's some recommendations for a stock block build with stuff you can mostly get on our website. And if you can't get it on our website, you can Google it because I know you can do that. With modern turbos, you can make insane power on a small frame unit. And it's one of the first things you should upgrade. You really can have your cake and eat it too. Picking a turbo is a great starting point as it dictates the rest of your build. If you want simplicity, T28 ball bearing turbos are still made by Garrett to this day. You could go with a factory unit, which is probably kind of old and beat up at this point, or you could upgrade to the GT2860 RS Disco Potato. I have no idea why people call it that, but they've called it that for like 15 years. They bolt onto the stock manifold. T28 is good for 300, and the Disco Potato will support a little bit more, like 330, 340. They are a bit dated. They get the job done. Now, if you just got your tax return and Uncle Sam's going to buy you a new turbo, check out the Garrett G series lineup. The G25 550 is the smallest in the lineup and is a very, very popular choice for SR owners. To put it into perspective, this turbo is roughly the size of like a uh, OEM T28, but it's capable of around 200 horsepower more. They are not cheap, but is probably the last turbo you'll ever buy for an SR. Keep in mind, if you want to make the most out of them, you will need a manifold, you will need a downpipe, you will need lines, you will need an external wastegate, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But if you want some headroom to build your engine and run E85, they will not disappoint. They respond very well to those things. Now, a little update for you here. Garrett did just launch the G25 585 in between the time we wrote the script and made this video. Same size as the 550, but with a claim 10% improvement in flow rate. If you want to be the first one to test one on an SR, well, guess what? We sell them. Yeah, we sell turbos. Who'd have known, right? You can click the link down below and pick one up. That was in between. You could go for an off-brand turbo. Some people have success with them. Others, not so much. We are not going to name any because one, we don't sell them. And two, we don't want to be responsible if it decides to blow up and ruin your engine. You can go on this little website called ebay.com. You can search like SR20 Turbo. You can gamble if you like to gamble. There you go. Don't run one off team. That's self-explanatory. Now, exhaust manifold wise, if you're not going with a bolt-on turbo, you're going to need an exhaust manifold with the correct flange, whether that's T3, V-band, or whatever else you're running. Keeping to the spirit of the build, we are going to recommend a bottom mount setup as opposed to a top mount setup. Top mounts look a lot cooler, but it's really meant for like big turbos. And if you want to keep things like JDM, the Tomei Express manifold, although Tomei USA, uh, anyway. Do or do not. There is no try uses a T2 flange, making it compatible with stock turbos. R-Tech manifolds are another option. They are fantastic. They are cast stainless steel. They are not cheap, but they are very, very cool. And they are supposed to work pretty darn well. So let's talk head, not that kind, and the valve train. While the stock bottom end is recommended for most, that doesn't mean the engine should be completely unopened. You really should pull the head off your SR. The head gasket is one of the first failure points and probably will fail at some point. If you're turning up the boost more than a few PSI, you'll want something like a Kometic head gasket or like an Apexi or whatever. Throw in some head studs while you're in there because you're already in there. ARP is a great brand, recommend that. And the next thing would be a set of drop-in cams. Depending on your car's use, you could throw in something super simple and call it a day. If it's going to be at high RPM for long, long periods of time, take what I said about drop-in, throw that out the window, and you'll want to fully build the head. Stiffer springs, valves and possibly the dual valve guide mod we mentioned earlier. If you're drifting, you probably want to do this because rev limiter and SRs are like oil and water. 
Now, fueling wise, most of the time side feed injectors with stock rail are going to be sufficient for what you need, but sizing of the injectors depends on a bunch of factors like fuel type, so we can't recommend a specific size. Just so you know, you can go up to 1000cc with bolt in injectors from like Dietchworks. If you're running E85, you might have to convert to a top feed fuel rail to run larger fuel injectors to supply enough fuel for you know what your SR needs. Depends on your power goals. Again, talk to your tuner. Now, clutch wise, if you're doing an SR swap, a new clutch before the engine is installed is a no brainer. You don't want to pull it out twice. An exited clutch will hold more power than stock while still being drivable. An ACT unit is also a fantastic choice. The Extreme 6 puck will hold a lot of power, but they are honestly awful to drive. Don't hit leg day and then drive your SR car. If you've got a couple bands sitting around, check out the Nismo Copper Mix options. They are really great clutches. They have great street manners. They are Nismo priced. So there you go. Now tuning, this is probably the most important category, and we don't sell it on our website, so good luck. You'll figure out an engine management solution first. You can ship the stock EC with a mail order tune. It costs about 400 bucks. It's fine. It's fine. It's 2025. Again, there's better options. Standalone ECU and Dyno Tune are better. There are a ton of brands. And no, tuning your car with a Game Boy. Yes, it's been done. A Power FC swap in the internals there you go is not relevant in 2025 get a hall tech get a link get another modern standalone I, I like hall tech personally but there you go going a standalone route gives you a bunch of possibilities like electronic boost control flex fuel converting from map to map engine protection which is a huge one and the list goes on and on from there now other mods tips tidbits and stuff like that we don't know what car you're putting an sr in maybe you've got one in your s13 maybe it's not these are some other um, mods that you might need to do to go with the chassis more so than the engine so front man in your cooler you got a turbo car you probably want this anyway full exhaust system it's kind of a no-brainer on a turbo car fuel pump upgrade this if you're running 85 and here's our advice on mods you don't need spend your money elsewhere like on some fresh new wheels what's behind me pick up a set intake manifold the stock makes more torque in most applications and the freddy ones that are sold on ebay kind of suck rocker arm stoppers again there's debate i personally have run them other people don't there you go the sr20 is one of those legendary engines unlike the ka24 which is a truck engine don't add us on that one as such it has way more potential due to the abundance of aftermarket parts for it but despite this there are obviously some drawbacks and we failed to mention the elephant in the room SRs are getting super expensive. Bro, do not buy an SR in 2025. I'm just going to put it that way. This is all the more reason to keep your build simple and reliable. We used to pay like 1800 bucks for these things. It's like five grand now. It's insane. Buy an LS. But if you want to build one, keep it mild, upgrade with quality parts where needed, take it to a competent tuner, and enjoy your 90s engine, which still competes with the best of them. If you like seeing us talk about engines and you want to see more videos like this, let us know in the comments down below. Another one we should talk about. I am itching to talk about the LS. It is my favorite engine on the planet. So if you guys want to see that, drop a comment down below with that. If you don't want to see that, also drop a comment. Hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, pick up some parts for your SR, or guess what? Wheels and tires, we sell them too. On our website, thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.